Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Platforms for Distributing and Experiencing Digital Work. My name is Kevin, and I look forward to spending some time with you today. I first would like to start by warmly acknowledging the traditional owners um, around the country, including where you are today. I pay my deep respect to elders past, present and future. Currently on screen is a PowerPoint slide with text video boxes of our guest speakers and our Auslan interpreters. I, the host, am a fair-skinned man with brown hair and have a, a white floral shirt on. Welcome everyone to Creative um, Connections. I will soon introduce you to today's speaker, Dr. Christy Dina. Uh, Christy will be guiding us through our first topic around digital adaptation. And this webinar series has been developed to support you during this time of intense change. They are bite-sized and will be delivered regularly throughout the coming months. We look forward to introducing you to some amazing speakers that will lead us through topics that are important to you. Um, I hope that we will learn together, we'll share and explore um, how we can adapt our leadership, our art practices and our digital capability. I invite you to register to as many as you can and please share this opportunity um, with, with others. Before we start, I just want to quickly run through a couple of housekeeping things. Um, firstly, that live captioning is available via stream text and you can find the link either in emails that you've received in either the chat um, function, which you can access via the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Please note that due to some recent uh, security changes in Zoom, uh, you will notice that linking directly from the chat um, feature has been disabled on some devices. So my advice is maybe just to type those URLs in your own browser if you need to. We also invite you to engage today in the chat feature. Uh, feel free to share your ideas, your links and your examples that relate to today's topic. And at the end of today's session with Christy, we'll really want to hear from you. So if you've got a question, um, please type that into the Q&A section. Again, you can find this at the bottom of your screen. And apologies if we can't get to all of your questions today, but we will try and get through as many as we can. We may also invite someone to ask a question live for Christy, um, and please note that these will be recorded. So the discussion today is about digital platforms. And if you have any other urgent inquiries, please email us separately, and then we can direct you to the right information. Also, at any point, if you need any support, please raise your hand. You can do this by using the hand raise feature. Again, you can find this at the bottom of your screen or just quickly pop us a quick email and we will try and respond. A final note, a recording of today's webinar, all of the slides and all of the links will be available to you and we will send this to you via email after the session. And um, then if you have not done so already, um, please join our digital support group on Facebook. I encourage you to continue this conversation and, and sharing and um, post the webinar on Facebook. You can just search for Arts and Creative Industries Digital Support when you're next on Facebook. Also, a reminder that the Australia Council's Resilience Fund is now open and taking applications. The fund includes three streams focusing on immediate support for survival, adaptation and creation. Uh, we also introduced a simplified application process and you can access the information on our website. Uh, so once you're on our website, just navigate to our grant section. So currently on screen is a PowerPoint slide to introduce our guest speaker. Um, there's some text and an image of a woman with blonde hair shot in portrait format. So now more than ever, digital platforms is so essential to our sector. And we need to innovate how we reach audiences, how we create work and how we collaborate. Our digital series as part of Creative Connections invites experts to provide us some practical tools and support for using tech 
in a creative and strategic way. Christy is a writer, designer, director, and technology is at the core of her work. Uh, for over the past two decades, she has done some pretty amazing and cool stuff. And she, she works across art forms and is dedicated to supporting inter interdisciplinary artists. Um, we invited Christy to give us today a, a practical overview of platforms for distributing and experiencing digital work. So Christy, thank you so much for being here with us today. And we listen, we really appreciate your time. And without further ado, I will just hand over to you. And um, I believe that you also have some um, slides to share with us as well. Hi, yes. Um, I won't go straight to the slides. Um, I, yeah, before I do that, I'll probably um, just say hello in person. Thank you, Kevin, for the introduction and hello to the team that is uh, behind the scenes in um, the Australia Council. Um, and also a thank you to my illustrator, Marigold Bartlett, who you'll see in the, the images in the slides uh, shortly. Um, it's wonderful to be with you all here now on this day that is the 8th of April in some places and the 7th of April in others. It is also during a super moon, which means that the moon is closest to the earth in its orbit and it's actually the closest time the moon will be, um, Sorry, it, it's closest to the Earth that the moon will be throughout the whole of 200, um, 2020. So we have big supermoon energy with us today, um, moving those waters and helping us to release. Um, you've already given us an acknowledgement of country there, and I can see people in chat sharing their own acknowledgement of country. I myself am on the um, you know, I pay res respects to the Kulin nations that I live and I make art on and um, to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, for those of you who don't know the country that you are in, um, in a browser, you could type in uh, native uh, hyphen land.ca and you can search. We're not putting it in the chat because you can't hyperlink it. Um, but yeah, you can type that in and find out uh, what country you are on um, from there. But I can see some more people um, sharing their country there. Um, but I want to add another aspect to this sharing of country. And it's something that was taught to me by um, Bowie DeBell, um, a Gamilaroi fellow from Northern New South Wales. And Bo introduced me to the concept, um, to a concept that rings true for me. It's a way of experiencing acknowledgement of country that includes time and space and how we are, quote, connected to each other in this moment through the story of the land. So let us all connect with our bodies and our places at this moment in time. And we're gonna go into a moment of silence where you can connect to your body, to your room, to the land that you are in, and to connect to the land through time, through time before colonization. Imagining the elders being there throughout time, just as they are now, and all of the caretakers through time, both the human and the more than human caretakers through time. So let's take a moment to connect with our space and through time. And we come now to the present. And um, we have elders with us as they will always be and the more than human. And we are connected to each other in this moment and joining the story of many lands, but also this shared space that we have created together, uh, which some people call a third space. 
So let's bring something to this shared space that we have. Um, and I call this a gathering token. Uh, something that you can grab from something that's in, uh, sorry, arm's reach on your desk or even in your pockets. Um, I have, for instance, a little statue of a kitten holding its tail. Uh, you may have a box of matches or a phone or something. This is a gathering token that you can offer to the space. So you can add into the chat a gathering token that you are offering to this space, something that is right around you and in front of you. Um, I'm going to type in kitty. We've got cookies, we've got feathers, we've got a watch, we've got a cup of tea, a plant, a dog, a candle. <laughs> So many wonderful things. This is a wonderful shared space that we have furnished with flowers and pencils and hats and mirrors, bunnies, books, footballs and birds. Thank you, everybody. Okay, I'm going to share the slides now. Okay, that's all good, Kevin? I think so. Oh, the stream is good. Okay, so I've been asked to, um, to talk about platforms for digital works. And obviously, this is in response to the isolation um, that we're all undertaking now in response to COVID-19. And this has meant that many organisations and companies, collectives and individuals are needing to move online to do their work and to connect with audiences. And I'm aware that for some, this is a major shift that is bringing up a lot of fears and concerns about how this can work. And those fears and concerns about your practice and work are happening at the same time as being ill, experiencing death, taking care of family, getting food on the table and navigating bureaucratic violence. But unlike the times when we've experienced that in the past, what's different now is that a lot of the world is experiencing disruptions to various degrees and isolation. There is a worldwide community that has been created with this shared event. So I'm gonna look at digital works that acknowledge this situation. And I'll be talking about platforms and strategies and when we think about what involves our decisions with platforms, uh, these are the factors that we usually come up with, as I have listed on the screens, uh, such as the needs and constraints of the audience, um, the artwork, the artist, the technology, business models, and copyright. Uh, but each of these needs dedicated time in themselves. Elliot, who is here, We'll be giving a talk as part of this series, um, looking into copyright. Um, there are other talks on business models. Um, and I will be providing you with a lot of links to platforms, as well as to webinars and help guides and groups that you can go to to find out more about the specifics of the features of technologies and how to work with them as creatives. And and also these slides, as Kevin said at the beginning, um, will be uh, emailed to everyone outside of this. So because a lot of this information is already out there, I've switched my emphasis to talking about things that aren't necessarily out there. What I find important right now when we're thinking about platforms. Um, and I encourage you to share your own thoughts as well. You can share links in the chat, but people won't be able to actually click on them. Um, but I believe we'll be sharing an archive of the chat afterwards. Um, and that's because in the words of Anne-Marie, um, Adrienne, sorry, Marie Brown, to quote, 
there is a conversation in the room that only these people at this moment can have. Find it. So to begin with, I have always um, considered platforms in their context. The places we work with platforms rather than going straight to the platforms themselves. Platforms like objects are in Western thinking often associate, disassociated from their context. So that's why we begin with our context, our context of COVID, our context of being in this webinar at this point in time, joining from our unceded lands and from our different countries. This is a context of not being in our usual places of work and art experience. So what are these usual places? These usual places are like these black and white illustrations ahead of us. Um, theatres, concert halls or warehouses, cafes, parks, museums and cinemas. These are some of the common sites of presence and connection. These platforms, and sorry, and the platforms in these places include large screens, uh, big sound systems, paintings, lights, stage, and bodies. But in the context of isolation, most people's places of presence and connection are in their own living room, their bedroom, their kitchen, and their study. And for some, their office, perhaps a hospital, a car park, or a shelter. Our theatres are now our living rooms. Our museums are our bedrooms, our concerts, our kitchens, and our cinemas, our studies. This is for some a shift in our relationship with the world. As the co-curator of the Chicago Architecture Biennial, Sepake An Kijama explains, and I quote, part of the process of unlearning is recognizing the power that architecture has on constructing the way we, be we behave. Whether you feel that you need to be quiet in a certain place, or whether you feel that you can be loud, the architecture determines that. This requires us to increasingly recognize that regardless of where you are in the world, Western thought tends to dominate. Its influence on our way of being, even if you don't study it specifically, comes through in lots of different ways. One of these is how we construct ways of being together. So what we are seeing is a shift to living, working and making from home. This is a move away from constructed zones of art, of business, to the personal. Western thinking, indeed capitalism, does not recognise the personal. This pandemic is asking for a movement inwards to each other. As the 13 Indigenous grandmothers said, quote, instead of traveling to a goal out there, you will voyage deeper into yourself. So we are bringing more of our personal selves to our art, our social experiences and work experiences. As creators, that means to call, a call to meet your audience in the personal. So here, for instance, we see a screenshot of musician Rufus Wainwright in a dressing gown at his piano playing music from his home. We also have a screenshot of actor John Krasinski. He's in a suit and tie, but he has a hand-drawn logo of this impromptu news network that he started. And we have Rebecca Solnit, um, from talking about fairy tales, annotating fairy tales from her home with flowers and a sculpture behind her. We see these artists choosing to meet their audience in the personal, to connect as themselves. 
In contrast, we have the screen, the screen producers um, Australia Council screenshot where we see the CEO seated in a big desk in a studio with glowing signage behind him, far away from the camera. And we see the musician Henry Waggins uh, rehearsing on stage for the delivered live, socially isolated music festival. Now there is nothing wrong with working with broadcast quality equipment. Notice that I didn't call these professional environments. And there's a reason for that, because I'm trying to unbundle professionalism with impersonal. The issue is not the use of equipment, but the set dressing and the urge to keep up appearances. There is a need to read the room or to read the multiple rooms we're actually in. And I understand that this is scary and new for some. There are fears around revealing who you really are. But living in the impersonal is one way that the privileged are complicit. There are many reasons to be your true self. Which brings us to the technologies in our rooms. Technologies like the ones we see in this illustration, laptops, mobile phones, tablets, games, audio books, they can be viewed as objects uh, disconnected or as containers of human thought, whim and emotion, as if they're separate, as if we're separate. But that's why I, I like the term touch points, which actually comes from marketing. Um, touch points uh, is about communicating how we connect with each other with media, how we touch across time and space, that we can affect each other no matter how far apart. And what we do with these technologies is based on a variety of factors. So here's a list of some options um, that I see for all of us going forward. Um, and let's go through each one of these. Okay. So distribution of existing content. You can put um, existing videos, audio, text, and visuals online for more access. Um, for instance, uploading a video performance that you already had uh, once you've got the rights sorted. Um, films, artist interviews, making of interviews, documentaries. Um, Ubu Web has been sharing archival footage and um, audio for years, for instance. Two, whoops, two examples here. Um, the difference with our isolated context is the need for real connection. And so we have the context of the shared viewing experience, even if it's a pre-recorded video. So an example here is the Australia Chamber Orchestra who have started Homecasts, where they're sharing archival footage and new recordings via Facebook Live. So they were, they're creating a shared viewing experience where you can comment and join together. Likewise, um, the Soda Jerks Terra Nullius uh, will be screened this Saturday in Australia and Friday um, in the Northern Hemisphere, some places in the Northern Hemisphere on Twitch for the Spectacle Theatre Company. Now Twitch is a streaming technology, a streaming platform that is predominantly a games audience. So when you're using Twitch, you're, you, you're bringing your own audience to Twitch, but also um, bringing new audiences to your work. But note too that the context is not just the desire for real connection, it's also the subject matter. How are the themes and mood of your work relating to what is being felt? If you're ever unsure about what sort of subject matter you should be putting out there, then just tap into your own needs. Okay, so I have a few links here. As I said, uh, you will be getting a PDF of this, so you can follow all of these links and explore them. These are some of the platforms and um, uh, examples that I've got here. 
and you can share some um, in chat as well. And I will highlight that there's a variety of, check, um, of technologies available to, for stream, some free, some requiring a lot of investment. Uh, and thankfully, the notion of shared viewing and playing is somewhat pervasive now. So there's already a whole lot of technologies uh, that you can draw on, such as Facebook Party, Netflix Parties, um, as well as Twitch and most online games. Um, I'm also going to put a call out here to Zoom and because I know some people are worried about Zoom with uh, issues about privacy and also safety. Um, Zoom are continuously updating their terms and conditions um, as well as their, their algorithms, their code in the background. Um, and Zoom, um, Zoom bombing can somewhat be controlled as well. So there's information about that on the web. But I will add that as far as I know, Zoom is the most accessible of a lot of the video chat um, and streaming technologies that we have out there. So that is one reason to keep going with that. Thanks, Elliot. <laughs> um, okay, so another approach is new works, adaptation of works to digital and the online context. Um, yeah, Jitsu, um, Jitsi is in there as well, but, um, um, but yeah, there's uh, still some issues uh, with accessibility, so yeah. Um, with new works, okay, there are changes to not just the way that it's experienced, but actually how it is made. You could adapt works created for different contexts to be online. For instance, you decide, as I said before, to live stream a performance, but you actually make changes to the performance to, um, for the delivery. An example is, uh, I'll give here is from the band Tao and the Get Down. Uh, they were ready to release their album um, and they decided to record their music video in Zoom. So you can actually go and watch their video that they recorded using the Zoom technology. And it's actually a cracker of a, tr a track as well. Another example is one actually from many years ago, back in 2009, but it's one that is that still sticks with me. Uh, this is an extended theater experience uh, that was done by the pervasive media studio um, Watershed in the UK. Uh, and what they did is they put cameras on the actors and in props and around the set. And so there were two ways to experience this specially designed production. There were people in the audience and then there were people who could watch the, sorry, and then there was the watching of the film of the performance afterwards. I was uh, not in the UK, so I only got to watch the film, but there were some audiences that experienced the play and then the film. Now this relates to what I call a reliving promise. Uh, which is like the excitement of um, going up and down a slide over and over again, where you get to relive what you really enjoy about it. And we're seeing that in part with the use of uh, Shakespeare readings, for instance, um, and particular songs. It's also because of copyright, um, <laughs> but we're seeing nostalgia and the idea of reliving things that we have experienced in other media now in this context. Um, so I recommend uh, checking out the link there because they show a short video of what they did. And the reason why it stuck with me is because it's the closest I've ever come to, to, to the feeling of what a live performance is like in the film format. So you can check that out. I also provide a link to where I talk further about promises, traversal promises. Okay, some more links once again. Um, so here are some more spaces um, to add to. Some of these are ones and examples of works. Some of these will be familiar and some of these will be unfamiliar. So this is another question that comes up when you're making decisions about platforms. Should you go with platforms that are popular and pervasive as opposed to lesser known? What if the lesser known ones 
are actually more ethical or they're more suited to what you're trying to do with your artistic performance or for many other reasons. So, um, yeah, sorry about the spelling, Erin. Um, so I want to add three thoughts here when it comes to, when it comes to making those choices about pervasive or quite niche and discreet. Okay, so firstly, I found that people are willing to move to lesser known platforms for a specific period of time, for a short length of the project. But if you're asking them to make a jump for a long period of time, then they're less likely to join and less likely to stay. Um, and we can talk about that later if you want. So that's one point that I've noticed. Second, and this is something that'll probably be a bit contradictory, ease of use, the concept of easy of use. It's a way of thinking that redirects the energy towards the comfort of the self rather than energy produced to bring us closer. Ease of use wants you to feel the smoothness, the smoothness of your body moving in concert with society. There's a nice flow to your tango. But this is an allowed performance when the system allows you to shine in certain ways. It's great when the system is, in, is invisible, when it's frictionless, because we don't want people to be thinking about the system. So ease of use could actually be seen as ease of being used, that, that you are easy to use. Perhaps we need to actually be used to feeling uncomfortable. And so in recognizing this, uh, let's develop uh, possibly another ritual of discernment. And that's around the connection with the actual technology and your own decision about what you want to work with. Um, and I say work with instead of use, and this is intentional. It's to give technology agency in the relationship. Objects, including the intangible ones, are connected to us too. Our technologies are as much part of Gaia as everything else in this planetary ecosystem. So we need caretakers of our human created technologies as much as ones of our plants and our animals. So I'm not giving you specific answers, I'm just giving you thoughts and potential processes here. Okay, so another angle here is um, born networked, if you like, creating works that are conceived and intended um, for this particular context. Um, and in fact, we are all in relationship with each other in the ecosystem of Gaia, but many of us are trained away from that. So what I see this moment and what I see network technologies is doing is helping us relearn our interconnectedness. And there's actually a rich history to this one of which I would like to do, do a call out to, which is something that, um, one of my favorites, which is telematic arts, um, that which some of you will be familiar with. So telematic arts, we've got Roy Ascot's book, I've got the cover of the book on the slide there, Telematic Embrace, uh, and that's a wonderful collection of essays that I think have a lot of relevance to right now in terms of um, how we are actually connecting across time and space. And then there's the key pivotal work um, in 1980 with Kit Galloway and Cherie uh, Rabinowitz with their work Whole in Space. And this is when there were people walking past um, the Lincoln Center of the Performing Arts in New York and they realized that they weren't looking at a window, there were actually people there and those people were at Century City in Los Angeles themselves thinking that they were looking at a window and then realizing that there were people there. So they were connected by a satellite and they were there uh, and that satellite connection was there for three days. 
There was no signage. There was no announcement. There was no explanation. And people started scheduling meeting with each other and some families that had never seen each other for decades were meeting up and saying hello over satellite. So there are wonderful key works that we can draw on. Another example just from a few years ago, but just to stretch um, a concept of the technologies that you're already using. Um, this is a interactive live action uh, murder mystery that was conducted on Facebook. Um, and that was done by a, a, a writer, well, a writer a colleague of mine, David Varela, worked on it. It wasn't his project. Um, and you can watch the video archive in the link there. One that's happening now is another one that's in Instagram, uh, the Seventh Circle Two, and that's by a colleague, Jan Libby. And both of these colleagues are from alternate um, reality gaming backgrounds, which is not augmented reality, but interactive stories experienced through interactive sorry, through everyday technologies. Um, it's these kind of projects that I learnt the kind of interactivity that resonates with me. So I'll share some quick points here. Interactivity is desired because it's not the default of being in Western society. It is for this reason that I'm not interested in interactive experiences that perpetuate systems of control, competition, domination, and abuse. So instead, I want to share some of the techniques that can be used for ill or can be used for nurturing. And these are presence, loop, agency, and direct. They overlap, um, but their particular um, emphasis that is really helpful to, to your work. Okay, so presence. How does the technology and the design that you've done enable you to recognize someone is present? And are you recognizing them on their own terms or yours? A loop, a feedback loop is when you as a player, as an audience, have a mental model of how you think the interactivity works and the logic of the world that is created and you act and then the system responds. And that response gives you an indication as to whether you understand how the constructed world operates. Figuring out the system is a pleasure in itself and something that is needed in our actual world as much as our um, play world. Agency. How can your audience and players affect the world? affect the little creative world that you've created and the world it's created and experienced in. And direct. Are people able to learn what they want, what they want through their own lived experience in their own way, through self-transformation and direct experience, rather than you telling them how your world operates? and how they should act or what the goal is. So for instance, with Hole in Space, there was no rules on how you are meant to connect or even announcing how it actually operates. Everyone had to figure that out for themselves and decided what they wanted to do with that connection. Um, checking time, okay. Uh, cultural development. So here we are, cultural development is another angle here. We've got the Australia Council for the Arts and this Creative Connections series working with Zoom and the Hey Summit um, platform. Another couple of examples here are the uh, little lunches online in which Artsfront are using Zoom as well as some custom website design. We've got Elliot here. Um, Elliot's also been um, sharing uh, videos on how they actually made, um, designed the project, which you can check out at Artsfront. Here we've also got Now Play This, which is a experimental games festival that moved online. And they've been holding their sessions live streamed via Twitch from different online games. 
This one is a keynote speech that was delivered from Animal Crossing New Horizons. Animal Crossing has, has uh, a lot of players right now because part of its design is around coziness and that's a place where there's a lot of people want to be. This is another project here, um, uh, which, is, uh, which I thought was really well put together. Um, in this one, there's a mix between Facebook Live, Facebook Watch Party, Facebook Threads, um, and, and Zoom pages. So the Facebook Watch Parties are because they pre-recorded the sessions. Um, I have done this before in my own online conferences, and I recommend this if you're not sure about um, you know, the connections of the speakers or anything like that. Um, I'll quickly go through to online studios. Now, a lot of people are used to working remotely. Some of you are moving into remote work for the first time um, or moving into remote work for the entire company. Um, what I found over the years is that there's a lot that has been shared about management technologies, but not about how you really create these wonderful studio environments. Uh, last year, I worked on a studio, a telematic studio with Cementa, um, which was great. Um, and we might have some people here from there. Um, and in the link, I share um, some videos in which um, the participants in which we were sort of discussing the process. So that can give you an insight into some of the ways that you can run studios online. But I wanted to share here some links to a whole lot of um, technologies that you can use when you are making projects with everyone online. One of the different contexts that we have now is that you can work internationally <laughs> with creatives, you can work with urban and remote artists, you can work with artists who are usually housebound and those who are, aren't. You can all come together um, and work on these projects. So I have some things that I can say about these, but we'll, we'll move ahead. And then here, project development. Now in studios, obviously, the switch there is that you're making together online. This is a one final thing that I want to offer as a different perspective as well. Um, it's a particular approach where, for me, I call polymorphic practice, um, but you can call it whatever you want. Um, it's basically when you're making your work in lots of different art forms, the same work. I'm not talking about a sequel, and I'm not necessarily talking about just creating prototypes, um, that you are actively creating your artistic work in different forms. And you can be doing that now with, for instance, if you have a live art production or you have a theater piece, you can experiment with what it's like in the digital and the online context and go back as well to your theater, theater format. Um, because I have found that this process really opens up things for me. So for instance, I'm working on an improvisational storytelling game that I've made as a card game, a board game, a Zoom game, um, as well as a festival experience, as well as a improvisational show, um, as well as creative writing prompt. And I found that through that process, I discover things that I need to include when I switch to a different context in a different form. But those new things that I discover can actually make the original or the previous work better and stronger. So I find that when I move across art forms, it actually reveals some blind spots and opens up my capacity to stretch my thinking. So I want to just put that out there as, a, as a, um, an opportunity that is here now. Um, and this is an example of some artists um, who did a production of La Madeira in Twitch and HowlRound. And they have their same philosophy. And I've linked to a great um, webinar with them. And this is what they said, I quote, 
rather than thinking of live stream as a platform for getting your artwork out to the world, we would rather think of how the different platforms can fulfill a playful creative process, joy, authenticity, or vision. Um, and so, yeah, there's a link to the webinar there and to the actual work on Twitch that you can see. And here we have some groups for you to jump into to help um, with you moving forward. Just a reminder, we will be sharing um, all of these links with you um, uh, via email. Okay, so the first one is the um, digital support group that Australia Council set up, um, which I know um, Elliot, uh, Elliot's in there as well. Um, and so there's a lot of information uh, in there. The second one, Together Films, is a collection of webcasts which is ongoing, in which they go into depth um, about the different streaming platforms that are available, and they're conducting interviews which e with each of the platforms, with, with people from the platforms. So there's a lot of really valuable information in those. The next one is um, online art and studio instruction. It's for it's art teachers who have now switched their studio practice to being online. There's a whole lot of wonderful ideas for, you know, how to do ceramics online and things like that. So I find that it's a, um, it's a great space for that. Um, the next one, Outside the Frame, is a wonderful one run by um, Beverly Natus, uh, which is about activist artists. Those first four groups there, they are ones that are directly connected to what is happening right now. The bottom four links are just general groups if you're you know, moving into the immersive and um, interactive space for the first time. So I'm just gonna quickly end here with the way my practice has changed based on the context of what has been happening in the world. We've got, had fires, we've got COVID now, and we have more coming. Um, and these are the, some of the, the, the principles that I'm operating from. Um, making works always uh, related to a personal experience, to what I am feeling um, and to the way I see things. Um, being in the present, always connected uh, to exactly what is happening, not disengaged and uh, disembodied and disassociated. Um, in which everyone is actually connected and you're seeing everything that you're doing as actually affecting others and regenerative in that it continues to nurture beyond the moment and beyond the short term. It's just a quick summary there, but I'll end now so we have time for a Q&A. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christy. Um, that was... Um, listen, thank you so much for the effort that you have gone through to prepare those slides and those links for us. I, I know that um, uh, all of us are going to benefit significantly from that work. So uh, um, thank you so much. So we're going to now move on to some questions and there's some lots of questions coming through. So just yeah. as a reminder, if you want to ask a question, just pop it in the Q&A section. So I will just sort of um, jump in and uh, ask some of these questions on behalf of some people. So if everyone don't mind, I will do so. So Fiona has asked Christy, um, do you know of any um, platforms that allows videos to be located on site beyond, you know, um, just QR um, codes? Oh, as in to activate them on site. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. So there's some augmented, well, I mean, you can connect via Facebook or, or you can connect online from any phone. I'm just trying to think what the design issue is. Um, oh, there are, um, I think you're talking about location Location sensitive? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I think I'd have to uh, understand more of what you're talking about because because someone can uh, you know access a, a video from their phone, you know, using any technology, um, and augmented reality is another one. So perhaps um, you can email me 
you know, directly afterwards and perhaps I can share the response once I know more details via email, you know, with everyone. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, shall we move on to the next question? Mm -hmm. Cool. So this question is from Riona. Uh, um, hello, Riona. Uh, uh, Riona asks, um, so sorry, I'm, I'm not quite paraphrasing exactly. So how can we encourage people um, uh, and these platforms to really think about access and making sure that that is at the core of the design of some of these platforms to ensure that it is more inclusive of diverse audiences? So what, what, are, what are some strategies around how, how, how do we engage that conversation? Yeah, there's, um, I, I do uh, link to a couple of resources in the slides um, that I found helpful. Um, and it is, it, it's, why, it's why I mentioned Zoom being accessible because, you know, there are people saying, oh, we won't use that. And it's like, well, I think we need to use possibly the most accessible platforms. The thing that I personally found is that when I am continuously um, connected to and working with um, people of different needs, then it becomes automatic, um, you know, in there. Um, and I'm trying to normalize uh, practices in there as well. So I think, you know, basically saying how, you know, make it unusual for people not to do that um, in there. Yeah, I, I don't know what to say other than, you know, the things that I'm doing is, um, you know, continuously researching, continuously going to events um, in which, uh, you know, like this, for instance, in which, you know, they have um, a lot of, um, uh, you know, different, um, assistance you know being offered which makes it you know it makes it normal um in there the way that i am reconceptualizing my design is highly influenced by the notion of the pluriverse um, and that is moving away from the idea of there being one dominant world one dominant way of being, one um, a monoculture, and um, you know the white able-bodied you know male sort of person, um, and so normalizing the idea of multiplicity. Mm -hmm. One of the concepts that I have found helpful it was actually from Microsoft, <laughs> but it's um it's called the persona spectrum, and what you do is every time you're making something you think about what are the the permanent what are the um, temporary and what are the situational things that are different so a permanent would be um let's say you were born without sight um temporary um you might have just had eye surgery situational mean you can't the sun is in your eyes but all of those situations are one in which you have the same sort of need but different different ways coming in um and so for me when i, I talk about that with people um i basically it helps them to realize that it's actually more people than they think you know that are actually you know dealing with the situations um there is no perfect able-bodied person we are all different and we all have needs. So, yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, I will go to another question if that's okay. Um, this is from Lauren uh, and um, her question is, do you know of any platforms uh, um, that are particularly suited or safer for a younger audience or children, particularly around, I take it running maybe let's say workshops um, or, or even, even distributing um, art, that's maybe my addition. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a, um, I know that there are even some schools that have banned Zoom um, because of Zoom bombing, but, but the issue with, with that is that it's when people know about the link um, as opposed to not publicising it. Off the top of my head, I don't, but I recommend the 
um, the online art and design studio instruction group that I link to at the end, because that includes um, people who are working with younger people. There was a few questions, so I won't sort of identify all of them, but there was a few questions that's coming through and I, I'm totally connecting with this question around screen fatigue, where um, all of us at the end of the day are just so tired of A, looking at screens, but also um, most probably looking at yourself uh, rather than everyone else. Uh, um, so that's quite a funny um, thing that's happening, clearly. Uh, but um, do you have any advice around how do we... I mean, in this moment, disconnect uh, from screens uh, and, and are, are there platforms, of course, that are not reliant on, on that? Do you have any thoughts on this and what's your experience? Yeah, so I switched to working from home a few years ago. So, so yeah, so um, firstly, I'll put one context uh, is teaching studio online. So I used to teach studio in person um, and then switch to teaching studio online. And unfortunately, I've seen some um, teachers, um, usually you have about five hours for studio and they've basically said, oh, we'll spend the same amount of time online, five hours. And it's like, no, 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 no. Um, you switch to doing more asynchronously and only connect online for short periods of time i used to go for an hour to an hour and a half at the most for any session that's it just cut it off and go um and but i'd have a lot of asynchronous stuff beforehand when you have the time to look over things and think about them that's another one of the shifts that we're seeing before it was like you always have to be on 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 Whereas now it's basically like, no, I'm going to spend my time thinking um, about this and I'll respond when I'm ready. Um, so yeah, more asynchronous. Don't just, don't just put everything online um, and making those times online um, ones in which you are actually connecting with each other. You're not just going through the motions. You know, it's actually nurturing you as opposed to sucking the life out of you, you know, because I think part of it is it's not online, it's the way it's been run online. Um, uh, and at the same time, yes, you've got to get up and get away. Um, I, you know, so I have many times in which I, uh, you know, walk around my place, getting a cup of tea, I go out for a walk, I put my hand on the trees. Um, and I, whatever you need to do, you know, to, to, to ground you. And I usually have um, a candle, which is, which, is, which is just dying now, but I usually have a candle or, or whatever, but yeah, you have to continuously move, reduce the amount of time that you're actually, you know, on the screen uh, and go from there. Listen, it, um, th that looks like it's potentially um, um, the only sort of time we have. There are so many questions that come through, so um, my apologies. Um, it's, it, this is clearly an area that we need to discuss more and explore more. Um, there's a couple of questions that's come through around um, price points and business models and monetizing. I might just draw your attention to on the 24th of April, we're doing a specific session on business model and yeah. monetizing digital work. So maybe, maybe please come to that one. And of course, join some of those other groups and keep those conversations going. Yeah, so, and the copyright one's coming up with and, and Elliot as well. Yeah. Um, we've got one around audiences, specifically around what audiences want online. So um, please, please join us again. So, um, yeah. Christy, uh, um, um, I think at this moment, maybe um, everyone, please um, show your gratitude by just shooting Christy a quick thank you note in the chat room, because I think you they have been. Thank you, everybody. Uh, listen, that's 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 fantastic. So thank you so much again. And, um, and we really, really appreciate, again, you, your time today. Um, great, great job. Thank you, Kevin, for the invitation. Great. Listen, just before we go, um, just a quick reminder that um, tomorrow's session, um, which is normally on a Friday, but of course, Friday's um, Easter Friday, but um, we are being joined by Lenin Burke, um, where she will be experience sharing her personal experience as an independent artist and providing some practical tips and ideas for sustaining yourself 
your finances, your practice uh, in this complex time. So um, please join us tomorrow for that. And then also the Australia Council is hosting a series of First Nations roundtables to provide a critical and much needed First Nations perspective on what is um, rapidly being a change time. Um, so these sessions are also via Zoom and you can also register for those via our website. So um, on that note, uh, thanks for joining us today and uh, we will see you soon. Thanks everyone.